Welcome everybody. It's autumn, it's October 2020 and the pandemic rages on. Uh, as we all know, the hospitality industry is up the creek without a paddle and it looks like to be the same way for at least the next six months. So to brighten up our lockdown lives, we've sorted a new series of Dine Hub stories and we're going to start all guns are blazing with the city's number one chef, our very own Yummy Brummy, Michelin star Glyn Pennell. Welcome Glyn and thank you for joining us as our very first guest on Dine Hub. Um, luckily neither of us have had Covid and I hope it stays that way uh, but you have been working on something exciting, your new book, do you want to tell us all about it? Uh, first of all, can I just uh, explain, we are in the, remember the broom cupboard? I mean, you might be too young to remember the broom I cupboard. I remember the broom cupboard, yes. Do you remember the broom cupboard? Clearly you must dye your hair then if you remember the broom cupboard. <laughs> anyway, obviously I don't dye mine. So the broom cupboard, this is our little broom cupboard. Uh, I am uh, Andy Peters and next to me is Claire, aka Ed the Duck. <laughs> So we're in the office, uh, it's a little bit messy, we would normally do this sort of thing um, up in the private dining room but thought we've still got customers in and we don't want to sort of disturb them so we've come down here to do it. So yeah, talking about the lockdown, it was an interesting time for myself. Um, first and foremost I was delivering prescriptions for 12-13 weeks on my old council estate where I delivered newspapers on Chelmsleywood and at 45 I was delivering legal drugs to the vulnerable <laughs> but also i was finishing uh my book pernell's the journey pernell's there and back again uh which is which is out now and we finished it all off sort of halfway through may it's gone to the print and now it was it was out it's been out since uh, last thursday so we've been really busy during the lockdown and we've been on the back with the bank and tell us all about it how different it's been four years since your last book what can we expect in this one well, this one is, and I've said it before, and I've said it a few times, this, for instance, if you went to see Alton John or you bought his greatest hits, you'd definitely get Rocket Man, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. So this is my greatest hits. It sort of touches on, you know, most people know the story, but there's a few twists and turns with this story about, you know, some of the stuff that you're not really supposed to know about restaurants or some of the things that have happened in the restaurant that you shouldn't really know, but I think you should know. Uh, and just basically the journey of, the, the, you know, from being bought up by Charles Wood, going down to the Birmingham markets, being a Brummie, all the way up to sort of meeting the Queen and, and, and opening a restaurant and basically living my dream, really. But also focusing on the people that were part of the journey, because I've said before, I can't do it all on my own. And I've had some fantastic staff over the years. And I've got some fantastic now, even in these difficult times, showing their support and stuff. And shown that they're part of Pernals and have been a massive part of the journey, which has sort of been encapsulated in this six and a half kilo book, um, which is enormous. Um, and people say it's quite expensive, but if you're paying by the kilo, it's actually pretty reasonable. I didn't know books could be that heavy, unless you've got the you know, Reader's Digest Encyclopedia, but it's a, it's a hefty tome by the looks of it. Yeah, it, it, it's, um, it's something that it's, it, it's a very much no heart you know we didn't want to go half in half out we, you know i've got two i've got two books and a kids book out and that's sort of like very aimed at sort of the, the massive general public on the back of sort of doing the tv stuff but this book is for people that have eaten at pernals that have experienced the journey that want to take and, and, and almost take a little bit of history in an art form uh, and have it on their coffee table or get rid of their coffee table and have that as the actual coffee table <laughs> And it's not, it's not just autobi autobiographical, but there's like anecdotes, stories, as well as recipes, as well as those secrets behind that. So it's all encompassing, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the artwork and the, uh, the pictures and, and the way it's laid out and the dishes in it are, are phenomenal. And, you know, it's just not myself, it's the team and also uh, away uh, with media with Andy Richardson. And, and so he's put it all together with me. And it's a bit of everything, really. And it's, it's, it's not just about the story about me, but the stories about the restaurants. There's, there's some fantastic recipes, so there's some amazing pictures of Birmingham in there as well which at the end of the day, it's that amazing. All you need to do is point the camera at it, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Well, that's the thing. It's like, uh, you know, you eat with your eyes. Something looks amazing, you want to eat it. And photography is so important with marketing a restaurant. Um, it's just like, how do you top that, you know, from book to book to book? Because, you know, that was the first thing that hit me. The, the picture look, looked amazing. And it's quite hard. Everyone can say, take a great picture of your food and it will sell. But it's actually really hard to get those photos, isn't it? 
Not even yeah, hard to put it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, also, I've got a really nice part of the book where we've got pictures of all the staff that, have been, that are here at the moment. Some of them have just left. Some of them have been here for a long time. But to capture the, the pictures of people, but also their character, which I think the book has really done, and wanting the pictures to, uh, to sort of almost showcase what part of the building that they, they work in. So, you know, I've got the guy on the pastry juggling eggs. I've got my sous chef filled with an octopus over the top of his head. So I wanted the pictures to scream out for them personally. So, so people can see that there's, there's different characters within, within the journey. And also, it, it's not just me. It, it's how diverse as well that the, te the team is. And in terms of the recipes, are they modern British recipes or is it an eclectic mix of different cuisines or is it just a, a showcase of your signature dishes? I think it's, it's, it's mainly a showcase of the, of the signature dishes. They are quite complicated because what we've done is we wanted to show everybody exactly how we get there. For instance, the bread, you know, the bread that, that, that you know, people have come and said it's the sort of the best restaurant bread they've ever eaten. It's so light. It's got two different flowers in it. So it's giving you the actual recipe so you can make that bread. It's all about the type of flour you buy. So it's, it's a little bit complicated, the recipe. So it's, it's, it's more for the advanced cook if you want to buy it as a cookbook. But for me, I think it's a collective book with a, with a massive story and different parts of it as well, which, which will hopefully tick everybody's box. So the greatest hits of your cooking career, what's the, your, what's the favourite dish in that book that you Ooh, enjoyed? Now, my favourite dish... Um, which didn't score that well in the Great Bish menu, but is one of the favourites here, is my haddock and eggs, which um, was taken from the inspiration of, of going down to the London market and my mum cooking haddock in milk and then she, she used to pour the milk away, I used the milk instead of the fish. And basically I've took my mum's uh, dish, which is a classic, we, we used to call it yellow fish when we were kids. It's taking yellow fish, when you walk in the market, there was just rows of it and taking that dish and turning it into a, a massive experience with the story. So that's one of my favorite. But also I think the real dish that shines is the monkfish masala because it's so organic and natural for the city. It's, it's you know, we're big fish lovers, except with the far away from the sea. We've got that real great, authentic sort of um, cultural mix of different ethnic uh, groups, which I, I love, you know, you can get them from Indian spices to, to sort of that modern twist with a little bit of Thai with the coconut milk. So I think it's nice to be able to put Birmingham on a plate. And for me, the monkfish masala is like Birmingham on a plate. Sure, awesome. Now, um, I was going to say, it's um, obviously you're born and bred Brummy, um, and you know, the, the journey of Birmingham and its colouring map just keeps getting better and better. And you always say that you're, like, you're living the dream and this is your dream job, but this year's been a nightmare. You know, how do you kind of keep your optimism up and your excitement and your passion going for everything that you do doing on a daily basis uh do, do you know what sometimes I ask, I ask that question myself i think you know because i love what i do uh, and there is no i don't the only thing we mince series meets we don't mince our words we love what we do and i've always been a guy when the glass is always half full so i've always looked at the massive positives of things and, you know, of all the restrictions that keep coming on and all the rest of it, we just keep adjusting and do what we love to do. You know, people turn around and say, if the world is spinning too fast, you know, take a step off it. But we seem to be holding on for dear life. So I'm just thrilled that we're back open again and that, that, that Brummies and people from across the country can still come and enjoy our food as long as you're out by one minute to ten. Like those spinning wheels you get in the playground, isn't it? And you're spinning around on the roundabout, yeah. going the edge like that, like that, and then you could you could fall off any minute. It's a bit. It's been like that week to week now, hasn't it? And you still go on there, even though you know it's going to make you feel sick. You still go on there because it's the thrill of the ride. So, and I think it's the the up and down of the industry anyway. And I think that's what's going to pull us through because we're so resilient of what's happened in the past over the years. This is obviously the biggest thing that's happened. I do think if you've got that desire, that passion, and you believe in what you do, and you can really sort of structure yourself, we're going to be okay, you know, it's going to be difficult. Uh, it is difficult, it has been difficult, and I know there's places that have fallen, but I think we just need to keep on eating out, stick by the rules, uh, try and look after our staff. And I think, I think, you know, in the next six, eight months' time, when there is a vaccine and when we've put a lid on it, I think we're going to flourish even more because... Just before um, lockdown, Birmingham was blossoming into an amazing city, which it already is. 
what was growing from strength to strength in the leisure the leisure park. So do you think and, and, but, yeah. So many chains have folded like week after week or every other week it's a new chain that's folded. So do you think we're going to um, keep, well that, is there a glimmer of hope that people will stick, keep going to the independence and they'll, they'll grow because the chains aren't there? Most definitely. And a lot of the, cha the chains have seen an opportunity to throw the towel in uh, because they can. And for me, you know, I do, obviously I feel sorry for anybody that works for a chain that hasn't got a job, but I'm sure as we get through and we start rebuilding again, there are going to be more opportunities in independent restaurants that we can develop skill on the streets. So it's not just a job, it's, it becomes a way of life and a passion and a skill for you to take on and move forward with. I think it is a positive thing that, that some of the big boys are struggling and, and some of the independents are thriving off sort of the back of it. Um, it's like there's a local shop not far from where I live where normally I would pop to a supermarket because it's convenient i've been shopping in this little shop now since the end of march and i still pop in there now uh, the guy's got fresh bread in there he's got a few cakes and stuff so i tend to try and go in there as much as possible to support the independent off the back of what he's sort of going on really and what would you suggest to people who want to start up their own rest restaurant what's uh, what's like the five must things you must think about clearly if you wanted to start a restaurant you need to think about you need to think about the fact that it's not just going to be a job. This is going to be a way of life. You're not going to make millions, but you could make a good living. Um, you can fulfill your dreams and your, uh, your aspirations to do well, to succeed in the industry. I think, you know, if you buy an apple for a penny, make sure you sell it for 3p. Um, make sure you, you look at um, your costs all the way through from the minute you open the door to the minute you shut the door. And like I said, it's going to be a way of life and it's not something you can wake up in the morning and say, well, actually, I'm not going in today. Mm. Um, it's something you're going to have to really put your teeth into and it's going to be rough, going to be ups and downs, but it's like anything in life, you only get out what you put in. So, I mean, that realistically is what I could say. Mm. And how much has telly played a part in your success? Obviously being Fatty Kitchen and Great British Menu and the other shows, um, you know, how significant has the impact been of that? I mean, has that helped you to, obviously has it helped you with, you know, selling more books or, you know, how has it helped you with sort of day to day thriving in Birmingham? I mean, before I did television, uh, I was successful in, in, in the culinary world anyway, mm -hmm. which obviously then TV sort of comes after that. So TV was always an afterthought because I didn't really want to do TV at first. I mean, I remember I got the phone call off Great British Menu and I turned it down because I didn't understand what it was and never saw the programme. I was already an accomplished Michelin star chef. I'd won a restaurant of the year, I'd won lots of awards throughout my career. I worked in two and three star restaurants. So the success of restaurants has been because I've got a fantastic product. But on the other hand, doing that media and juggling the media, the TV, Saturday Kitchen, more importantly, Great British Menu, which showcases exactly what you do. It, 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 you know, it really helped along because we went for a stage at Plan Isles, which was, it did, we just started into sort of the credit crunch and the first recession around about 2008. Yeah. And we didn't do the Great British Menu to, to, to sort of Easter of 2008. And we really struggled through the, win through, through the start of the year. Great British Menu came on, it showcased what we do and it exploded. And I think doing enough television to keep you ticking over, to keep your, your sort of your, your, your skills and, and what you cook in, in you know, in, in the media, obviously just helps support the rest of the local stuff and also, you know, with people that want to eat out in this sort of style of restaurant. So, you know, that's really helped, um, you know, the sales of books, I mean, I'm not going to retire on that, but it's, um, it certainly helps you, um, you know, put a few quid in the tills to keep you ticking over. I think that's the biggest, biggest misconception. Like, oh, you've got your Michelin star now. And it's like, not, not rest on your laurels, but you're there now. It's never going to be taken away. But, you know, people forget you're marked on that year on, year on, and you've, you know, done brilliantly to get keep it for 11 years. Um, but I think people forget. And also, you know, keeping the brand out there. And obviously, as part of Delicious PR, we're always hammering that home. And you can't really just uh, open the doors, hope for the best, and kind of, you know, you've always got to be proactive, don't you? You've got, you've got to keep that balance. I mean, I'm here most of the time, you know, so if I do Saturday kitchen, I might miss a lunch service, but I'm back on the, um, on the Saturday evening, mm -hmm. which I always do because people will see me on the Saturday kitchen and they go, well, he's not going to be in tonight, is he? Because he's, you know, he's down in London, but, you know, London's an hour and 20 minutes away and I'm back in the kitchen by four or five o'clock because I make a massive point of that because 
I know that people come to the restaurant to celebrate a special occasion and they do like to see me. I don't know why, but they do. Mm -hmm. And I try to, I'm always here as much as possible. So it's something I've always done. And also, if I stay at home, I have to watch my wife's rubbish programme. So I'm better <laughs> off in the kitchen to be honest with you. Which do you love best, being a participant in these shows, a judge or hosting, hosting your own show? Ooh. Uh, now, I do love, I've really grown to love hosting, especially with the live stuff, because what's great about that is I sometimes, just before we go live, I think to myself, why have they given me the responsibility of this show in front of one and a half million people? That's what I find hilarious. And coming from where I'm from, from Jamsey Wood, I've had no real media training, uh, you know, and I just like the fact, I love the, the sort of um, uh, the adrenaline which goes through you just as you go live don't get me wrong you hear the music on the kitchen you think you're going to throw up but that's just <laughs> i just sort of feed off that um that energy and that um sort of um tension that, that really makes me sort of throw myself at the show and just actually enjoy it so hosting i'd say is probably one of my favorite bits now and are you a nightmare to go out to dinner with because i've got chef friends and i'm just like oh we can't take him because he'll be like nosing around in the kitchen having a word with him and going oh you know they should have done this that it's just like oh can we not just enjoy our dinner or you know, hanging out together are you a bit like that well first of all were you asking me out for dinner i just thought i'd ask I that guess. first i definitely autumn date it's my okay birthday. fine okay no, we'll, we'll sort that out we'll sort that out um no for me i take Wherever I go, I sort of half know what I'm going to get, if you know what I mean. So if I go to, I don't know, uh, a Chinese restaurant <coughs> or, or, or a Balti house and stuff, I know that I'm going to get a really good, tasty plate of food. You're going to have a hustle and bustle of what it is. And, or if I go to a Michelin style restaurant, you know, it's all about value for money. And, and, and I think that's important for customers to look at. You know, you, you, you re realistically get what you pay for. So if you're going to a high-end restaurant, you should get that service. You should get that quality of ingredients and you should get that wow factor. If you go down the road and you're going for a bacon egg sandwich, you're going to get a bacon egg sandwich. So I try to, for me, judge it for what I'm paying for. But I try to relax and enjoy myself because I think eating out is, is a fantastic thing. If you can afford to eat out, especially tough times now, but I think it's a fantastic thing to go out, enjoy some of this company, uh, eat good food and just sort of forget about stuff for a while. And I think eating out is most definitely turned into that. I mean, obviously, sadly, we've missed a lot of the... Can chefs relax and enjoy themselves? Oh. Uh, I can. A lot of them have got what's called a pickle up their ass. So what they need to do is remove that and realise all they do is cook food for a living. I think <laughs> that's what we need to realise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. I'm sure it's and they know, and they know who I'm talking to. They know that. I know that. They're they know that, yeah. yeah. As we speak. Sorry, what was that? So their ears are burning as we speak. And, and if they want me to tell them personally, they can just ring me. They know I'm not sort of worried about confrontation or telling people the truth because I think sometimes it's best served. <laughs> I think the truth. Um, but I like to. I like to. I like to sort of say that um, when I do go out, though, what is nice is the reception I get from the hospitality staff from the general public it is really really nice some people are a little bit too keen and don't let me chance to eat my dinner but that's fine i understand that they're, they're excited to see me so what i do get and i do really love is the fact that because it's 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 such um a great nice thing to to sort of be recognized in public and sort of have people come and say hello that is another, another nice thing about um about what i do and stuff uh, and I've never really had any negativity from going around Birmingham and stuff, which is really, really nice the way that people are. What's the funniest story you have about a customer who's actually, you know, just from serving or like a fa you know, fan boying or fangirling over you? What's the <laughs> funniest anecdote? It could, you know? could be here a long time if I start telling you two of the stories, but I will tell you this one. Last, uh, two days ago, no, yesterday, um, most relevant one, yesterday I was in the bistro just having a quick coffee, just picking up stuff with, with the general manager and four women um were just celebrating one of their 40th and they were insistent they were so excited they were insistent they wanted the picture uh, but unfortunately we had to have a picture two meters apart with a mask on so that was a little bit weird but they were so excited to see me and it was it was it was really nice that in such a negative time how happy and excited people can be and and i embrace that you know so yeah apart from obviously uh, you know people throwing flowers and knickers at me it's generally just nice to say hello 
I know they ditched you with a whole pile of knickers around the corner on Newhall Street. I thought that was uh, due to you. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah. I mean, there's, there's bags of them in the office as well. I mean, I just thought they were Claire's, but clearly people <laughs> just send them. So if you do want to send your knickers or underpants men, uh, just send them straight uh, care of Claire. Thank you. Brilliant. It's been brilliant to talk to you. Can you just tell us how we can get hold of your new book? So if you want to grab the book, uh, you can get it on Amazon, uh, which is the only outlet apart from Pernals. You can come in and buy it from Pernals, or you can go onto our website and buy it direct when it gets delivered. Um, and yeah, it's, it's six and a half kilos. So if you are walking in to come and get it, make sure you've got a good, sturdy uh, bag for life. Uh, or you can have it delivered. It, it's up to you. So it's only two, two places you can get it from. Three places, sorry. The website, Amazon and you can come walk into Pernals and get it as well. So, and there is only uh, 1,500 copies, so they're a limited edition. And once they're done, they're done. Well done. And if they come into the restaurant to get them, will you sign it for them? Most definitely, most definitely, yeah. Um, well, yeah, if you, buy them on, on, if you buy them through the website on Amazon, you'll get like a signed card. But if you buy it at the restaurants, you come in, you get it signed. It's all from the same three people, so you're not doing anybody a favor either way if you buy them off, whatever. Come in, I'll sign them, I'll come and say hello, two metres apart, with a mask on, that's what'll happen. And you've got to have a signed cookbook for me, number one chef, that's just that good. So it's a, um, I would say it's a good Christmas stocking filler, but actually we need like a big truck to have that one. Really, really. Well, you, you'd be surprised at some of the size of the stockings that get sent here, Anita. It's probably some of the drag queens from, uh, you know, her street have sent those in, haven't they? I'd imagine so, but you know, we'll fill their stockings as long as they ask. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Uh, hope everything goes well with the book and these horrible new COVID measures doesn't affect business too much. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll check out, check back in with you soon. Okay, thank you. and can I just say well done to all of the hospitality industry that have tried hard and the retail as well. That obviously it's difficult for us all. We're here to serve people. Keep doing it, guys. You've done a fantastic job. Yeah, and if you don't use it, you know, you'll lose it. So keep on using it, keep on eating out and keep dying. Keep on eating out, keep these little independent shops open as well.